Oh, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's 310, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for sticking around for the, the last talk in this room today, uh, WordCamp, uh, Dayton. It's my first time here, but kind of exploring the area. My brother's out in Beaver Creek, so excited to be here with you all in from Chicago. Um, so to kind of wrap up here today, we're going to learn a little bit about modern tooling with WordPress, if you couldn't have guessed from the slide in front of you. Um, my name's Keenan. My, my parents blessed me with a very unique name, both first and last, so I get this handle on pretty much every social network. Um, you can also email me, which I check way too much. And instead of like trying to write down every link and every name of everything you see in the talk, um, I put up a page at alphaparticle.com slash WC Dayton with all the links to everything. So um, you can kind of go there and peruse. The links to the slides are also there, um, as well as WordCamp TV, if and when that becomes available. So uh, WordPress is turning 16 this year. A couple other talks have mentioned that, but uh, it's been around for a while. Um, obviously very different from when it started. Um, but it's, it's evolving as an ecosystem and as a community. Um, so when WordPress kind of started out, at least when I started working with WordPress, um, most all of the options for hosting were your, your basic kind of shared hosting platforms um, where you got cPanel and you got uh, FTP access. Uh, that was pretty much it. Um, initially, WordPress didn't have great support for custom fields and things. So if you wanted to do that, you had to dig up the docs for add meta box and figure out how to you know, do all the saving of your stuff custom. Um, it was pretty tough because the stuff was on shared hosting to do like monitoring or figure out which parts of your application were slow and kind of what was going on there. Um, and a lot of what WordPress started with was small to medium blogs. So now, you know, contrasting, you kind of see that it's evolved into more of an application platform and really big websites are running on it. Um, some of these up here, um, I, I hope there's at least one name up here you recognize. Um, so all of these companies have web presences on the WordPress platform. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking about how they might manage this process, knowing they have a bunch of developers working on their platform, um, it becomes easy to see that they're probably not drag and dropping files with FTP. Um, so how has WordPress evolved to support these kind of large scale deployments? Um, and, and what can we learn from that to make our own work more efficient, even if we're not working on, on big things like that? Um, so these are all linked up on the page as well. Um, kind of some looks at this, uh, a different version of this talk that I've done, um, a cloud scale WordPress talk put on by the folks at AWS. So pretty uh, big name there talking about how you can uh, deploy WordPress into the cloud if that's your game. Um, and also this talk. So if this is something you're interested in learning about, you're in the right spot. Um, if you're not, then like uh, we said earlier, I won't be offended if you decide to leave. Um, so the overarching theme of this talk, as I was kind of going through it and putting it together, is I realized that a lot of the stuff um, that kind of can take WordPress to the next level is taking actions that you would traditionally do in the admin, um, setting up plugins or installing things or, or you know, configuring uh, custom fields and options like that, and defining them uh, in code. You could put code in quotes if you want to because it's kind of a different format uh, in some cases. Um, but this makes it really easy to keep track of what's going on um, across multiple environments. So if you're working on your local and then you're moving to a staging environment, uh, you're moving to production, like you don't have to recreate all the fields in the admin every time. Um, it also makes it easier to work with multiple people because you can version control your entire project and then when someone new joins the team, they can grab the repository and all of the kind of settings for various things are in there. Um, so as you scale up WordPress, like this configuration is code idea um, is a lot more important. And so if that doesn't quite make sense yet, we'll go through a bunch of examples. Um, but that's going to be key. Um, so that's kind of the high level overview of everything we're going to go into. Um, one more thing I want to say before we get started is like this, I don't use all of these tools on every project. Um, I wouldn't suggest that you do either. Um, and the idea is not for you to implement everything you see here, but hopefully um, you have a specific problem. Um, either you know about already or you'll realize when you see one of these tools that might be able to help you out. Um, and you can pick just like one or two things and go implement those. Um, that's the idea. So. Not to overwhelm you, we're going to go through a lot of stuff, but hopefully kind of one or two things resonates with you and you can uh, makes you more efficient on your next project. So the first thing we're going to talk about is local environment. Um, so I'm assuming mostly developers in the room. Um, how many of us are using a local environment, developing on our computer somehow, some way? Good, cool. Um, this wasn't really a thing, at least for me and, and the people I was working with when I started. It was pretty much, again, like we had our FTP target and we you know, put files on there and made changes in there and, and made changes in the admin. Um, but local environments are great because they let us work uh, locally, not on the live site, and test things out and, and develop features over a longer period of time 
without having to worry that like we're breaking the experience on the live site or the site's going to go down or something like that. So the first option that technically is a local environment um, is you can just install PHP and MySQL kind of on your machine, especially if you have a Mac, that's really easy. I think it comes with PHP and maybe MySQL already installed. Um, the problem with this is, you know, if you're working on multiple projects and one needs a different version of PHP or you need to upgrade or something needs, you know, kind of gets off, um, that's your machine. So you really have no option to just like destroy it and start over because that's your whole machine. So um, possible, but I would not recommend it. Um, so something that's become pretty popular in recent years uh, is the idea of running a tool called Vagrant inside uh, VirtualBox. So what this essentially does is it creates a virtual machine uh, inside your computer and everything is self-contained in here. So what's great about this is you can install, if you have a project that requires specific versions of things, you can install just those specific versions in kind of this virtual machine. Um, you can turn it on and off as you need to. You can have a bunch of them running uh, side by side. Actually, so we'll jump to this in a little bit, but these, so these are all the various like virtual machines that I have uh, on my computer. So, you know, you see uh, Local by Firewall, which is a tool we'll talk about, has its own there. Um, for when I need to test stuff in Internet Explorer, I have a machine that I can turn on and off to do that. Um, and there's, so there's just a bunch of various things that I do here. Um, but it's nice because it's self-contained and you can I'll work with it specifically. Yeah. So Vagrant, I believe, works with VirtualBox and uh, a couple others. VMware, I believe, it can do. Um, but yeah, you can when you when you download it, you can specify um, what you want to work with. Thought maybe it'd be quick here, but I think you I think you can do it with. Oh yeah, there's a link to VMware up here. So yeah, you can do it with VMware. You just have to tell it when you when you look for your Vagrant box that we want to do VMware. So what is Vagrant exactly? So it's a it's a virtual machine um, hooking into one of these virtual machine virtualization tools, so VirtualBox or VMware or whatever, um, with a specific configuration that's defined in what's called a Vagrant file. So again, this idea of configuration as code, uh, this Vagrant file, you say, you know, what base operating system do you want? How much RAM do you want to give it from your machine? What you know, you can define all these things. What what software do you want to install? Um, and basically, then you have this self-contained environment. You tell Vagrant, okay, bring up this machine, and it, if it's the first time you're running it, it goes and grabs all those resources for you and creates the virtual machine. Um, but then, like I said, you can just turn it on and off as you need to, and once you've done the work of initially uh, creating it and downloading everything you need, it comes up pretty quick. Um, just like you know, starting up your computer versus getting it from the store and installing the OS and all that stuff. Um, so because it's, an, it's its own separate machine, you can get access into it and upgrade packages on it independently. You can upgrade the whole box if you want. Um, it really is just like a machine inside your machine. So we already talked about this a little bit, kind of all the various ones that I have running. Um, so it kind of goes on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, Homestead we'll talk about in a little bit, but that's running like, I don't know, 10 or 15 sites on there. Um, and then some of these are just for individual specific projects. So you can either have one machine that encompasses a whole lot of projects, or if you just need, you know, one machine for one project, like I said, you can turn them on and off so they're not sucking up all the resources on your computer. Um, so, so one good option that's targeted specifically toward WordPress uh, is varying vagrant vagrants. Don't try to say that five times fast. Um, basically what it is is it's a wrapper around vagrant that lets you uh, spin up and create, you know, WordPress sites uh, much more easily. So again, it does configuration as kind of a code-based thing. Um, if we wanted to create a site for this conference, we could just basically say, okay, we're going to create a site called Dayton. Um, we want the host to be Dayton.test. You could do Dayton.local, whatever you want it to be on your local machine. Um, and then it supports templates. So basically this template is just kind of their getting started one. It's a very basic one that just installs WordPress and a couple of their debugging plugins. Um, but basically you just specify this in your config. Tell Vagrant, okay, I want to go run this and bring it up. Uh, and then you have a WordPress site inside this kind of virtual environment. So that's really great as opposed to, you know, having to go download all the WordPress core files and then, you know, uh, put them in a folder and configure the database and then change your WP config and all that stuff. Um, it's really a lot quicker just to kind of bring that stuff up. Um, and it's all inside of virtual machines. So if you do this and then you decide you don't need the site anymore, you can delete it and tell Vagrant to get rid of it or you can spin down the whole virtual machine um, and go from there. Homestead is another option. Uh, it was built originally in the Laravel community, so it's not, it doesn't have as many WordPress specific options as, as VVV does. Um, but it's also based on Vagrant, so it's much the same idea. 
Um, it's a very similar syntax, so in this case, you have to tell it where, so all of my various sites live in my code folder, and on the virtual machine, I want that to be in home vagrant code. So then once that mapping of folders is set up, you can just say, okay, I want a new site here, and whenever somebody hits this URL, it has to go look in this folder, which is where all my WordPress code is gonna be. Uh, this is a much more manual process, because I have to actually make sure that WordPress exists in that folder, and that all my config is set up correctly. Um, but again, if you work on stuff that's not just WordPress, um, this is a good option because, you know, on this virtual machine, I have WordPress and Laravel projects living side by side. So um, it's kind of nice that way. Um, so then also the, another option is Docker. Um, this is a question mark after because I'm not super familiar with Docker. Um, it's one of those things that's like sitting over here and I know I need to learn it eventually because it has some benefits over a virtual machine. I just can't really quantify that. So if there's any Docker people here, um, let's chat later, because that'd be awesome. Um, but but TenUp, a, a relatively large WordPress agency, has a setup called WP Local Docker, which will get you up and running um, if, if Docker's your thing. Cool, so we've got a local environment set up. Um, what are we gonna do about actually developing? So we talked about some workflow things that were kind of clunky in the past with you know, FTP and, and versioning and all that stuff, and even just working on the site itself. Um, kind of, how, how can we put these things together? So. Uh, a big kink in the workflow of the past was if you wanted to install a plugin, you either had to go through the admin or download a zip file um, and then drop it in your plugins folder, um, activate it through the admin and stuff like that. Um, but in recent uh, years, there's a tool called Composer that's being used in uh, PHP bro more broadly. Um, but specifically for WordPress, there's a tool called WPackagist, um, which is kind of a, a playoff of packages, which is a Composer repository for the bigger PHP community. Um, and what it allows you to do is every pl public plugin on the WordPress plugin repository is mirrored here. So if you're familiar with Composer and you know how to use that to manage PHP packages, show of hands, how many people is that, by the way? Not too many. Okay, so real quick, uh, Composer basically is, uh, again, a, a tool that lets you specify one file and it says you can specify here's all of the packages that I need to run my software. So before you start running something, you can just say Composer install and it will go grab all of those different uh, PHP libraries for you so you can run your code. Um, and again, these are specified in a file so that if you check your code into version control, uh, you don't need to tell another developer, oh, make sure you install these five packages. They just can get the file and then have Composer install everything for them. So much in the same way, uh, WPackagist allows us to manage plugins in this exact same way. So you can, in your Composer file, list out all of the plugins that your uh, site needs to operate and then check that into version control so that when someone downloads all your code to start working on the project, um, they can just run Composer install. And it will take care of putting all the necessary plugins into the plugins folder. Um, so you don't really have to manage this then through you know, an onboarding doc that says, hey, here's all the plugins you have to install or some of the other ways that people have done this in the past. Um, you can just let the tools help you and, and automatically install things for you. So. Um, yeah, seems like maybe not super useful for all of us here, but if you use Composer already, you're familiar with this. Um, if you experience the headaches involved with telling people which of the 20 plugins they need to run their local, definitely uh, look into this a little bit. Another thing uh, is for a while there was kind of this common perception that plugins are basically just for you know functionality on the site or for end users, um, but, but there's a lot of plugins that are specifically targeted towards people who are working on sites uh, and building things. So one of these is objects to objects. Um, in my opinion, this is one of the times where if this is a requirement of what you're building, WordPress maybe is not a super great choice for it. Um, but if you have to, you can basically relate, like the title says, objects to objects. So if you have posts um, and say galleries and you want to make sure uh, certain galleries are related to certain posts and you want to have this connection so that on the post page you can display all the related galleries, things like that. Um, objects can be anything. So objects can be users, objects can be custom posts, types. Um, posts, I believe even comments and, and things like that, pages obviously. Um, so you can kind of make these connections and it makes it much easier to, on the front end, then display these objects that are related as opposed to having to you know, go into WPDB or make direct database calls, um, you can do that. So this is a little small and this is mostly for uh, the slides if you go download them online to see kind of how it sets up this connection. But this is exactly what we were talking about earlier where we want to be able to relate galleries to a single post. Um, so just, again, this idea is like, okay, we're not defining this relationship anywhere in the admin or doing anything like that. We're actually putting it in the code. So this would either go in a plugin that we were building or, or in a theme um, that says, hey, we know we're going to have this post type called galleries, and we want to relate it to posts 
so that we can, it then also gives you an admin interface for whoever's writing the content to make those relations um, and, and things like that. So take a look at this online if you're interested, um, but just know that that's there. So uh, Field Manager is another one. Um, I, I'm willing to bet that lots of us here have used advanced custom fields or something to that effect. Um, Field Manager is a similar uh, situation where you can define custom fields and then have them magically show up in the admin. Um, but you know, as we go through this and, and keep thinking about our common theme, these are defined in code. So while ACF is, is great and it has an awesome admin interface and lets you do all sorts of customization, um, Field Manager actually lets you do this in code. So once again, it can be version controlled um, and it can be, you don't have to you know, recreate those same fields when you move between environments and things like that. So ACF does have kind of an export where you can generate all the code and the, all the fields in the admin and then export it to code. Um, Field Manager just kind of skips that step um, and lets you write the code directly. So not something that everyone's comfortable with. If you rather would have that admin interface, like that's great. Um, but if you're more working on a project with a bunch of people and want to make sure all your fields are version controlled, things like that, uh, Field Manager is great. Um, and yes, ACF, honorable mention, we talked about kind of pros and cons of that. So this is just how adding a, a group of fields would look with Field Manager. Um, so we just, you just specify we have a group of fields. Uh, in this case, we'll just add you know, contact information to a post, for example. Um, we want a text field for name, a text field for number, and then a link to the author's website, we'll say. Um, and then you see the last line there, just add meta box contact information. So it'll just add a box below the post that says, uh, you know, here's the, here's the field we want. It handles all the things about saving them and, and sanitizing the input and stuff like that. Um, more details to come on how this works with Gutenberg, but uh, in the past with kind of the classic editor, this is how it would set up the different meta boxes. So if you need custom fields and you feel comfortable writing PHP, this is a solid option for you. Query monitor. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have dealt with the situation where a client calls up and says, hey, you know, my page is taking 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds to load. Um, I once got that call and the number was 60 seconds, which is a whole fun different thing. Um, Query monitor is a tool that sits right up in the top, uh, that, that little black admin bar that everyone tries to hide. Um, query monitor sits up there on every page load, and, and if you have PHP notices, PHP uh, warnings, PHP errors, um, it will turn different colors to kind of alert you to the fact that, hey, something's going on. Um, but it also profiles things like database queries, so if you have a particular section of your template that's making a really slow database query, um, it'll call that out in, in bright red text for you. Um, it, it's super comprehensive in terms of what it will do. Um, the first time you use it, you'll probably use it for one specific thing that it does, and then for, you'll use it for a different thing on a different project, and I would not recommend trying to understand all of it at once. Um, but if you have something that's kind of weirdly happening, or you have a, a check, uh, like your checking is single and that's not returning true when you expect it to be, um, it, it gives a lot of information into like what WordPress thinks it's loading, what templates it thinks it's loading, what database queries each component of the page is making, uh, and stuff like that. So. If you do a lot of work with inheriting projects that you then need to upgrade or fix and, and things like that, this is great. Um, Query Monitor would definitely recommend checking it out. Um, and yes, you'll have to unhide the admin bar for it to be pretty useful while you're working on the site. Rewrites are another area of WordPress that's kind of a black box in a lot of ways. Um, who's worked on like doing custom rewrite stuff here before? A couple of people. Yeah. Um, so it's more of that regex fun that Steve was talking about before. Um, and it's really finicky.